Welcome. One encounters the number E in a calculus course is the number that's natural and easy for calculus in the following sense. If I use E as the base of an exponential function, say E to the X, then it turns out the derivative of this exponential function is the easiest thing it could be. It is itself. Well, easy would be if it was a constant, but that's not the case. Um, so um, the derivative of e to the x is basically itself, and that makes calculus so much natural and much easier. In fact, if we use e as the base of a logarithm, we call this the natural logarithm of x, uh, one learns, and it's not very hard to derive from this property, that the derivative of the natural logarithm is pretty straightforward. It's 1 over x. If you use the fundamental theorem of calculus and say this backwards, that uh, in t think of this in terms of areas under a curve, that's telling me the integral of 1 over x dx, and if I go from, say, 1 to some positive number n, that is actually the natural logarithm of n minus natural logarithm 1, which is L of n. So the area under the 1 over x curve is basically the natural logarithm function, if I go from 1 to n in this case. All right, that's actually very handy, and it's very simple in calculus, and it's the natural thing to do in calculus. However, a student typically does not encounter E for the first time in a calculus course, but in a pre-calculus course in the study of compound interest. In fact, this has actually got Euler going in the first place. He was studying continuous compound interest and needed a special number with uh, certain properties, and it turns out that number is the very same E as appears in calculus. But that is not at all obvious. It's often left as a mystery for students. The E they encounter in one course is really the same as the E as they encounter in a second course. Well, the link between the two is actually not difficult, and that's what I want to talk about today. Obviously, I'm assuming we know calculus. I've already talked about derivatives and the fundamental theorem here, but here goes. I'd like to explain that the E from compound interest really is the same E that arrives in this context as a function whose derivative is itself. Here goes. All right, compound interest. Well, it derives from simple interest, interest taken to the limp limit. Suppose I have a, a bank account and I earn R percent per year. Um, R is usually expressed as a decimal, so when I say R percent, if it's say 5 percent, that really corresponds to the decimal point 0.05. Uh, if my interest rate is 10 percent, that really corresponds to the decimal 0 0.10. Little point of confusion, but not a big deal. All right, suppose I invest one dollar. I'll keep my math easy. So after one year, I'll have my one dollar, plus I'll have R percent of my one dollar. Not very exciting. If I, but that's assuming interest is calculated just one time a year. If it's calculated every month, then after my first month, I'll have my $1, plus if it's, you know, at the end of January, I'll have R divided by 12, so it's going to be that amount per month interest. Uh, at the end of February, I'll have this amount again, so all of it, or one of it, plus I'll have R divided by 12% of it again. After three months, I'll have all, all of this, plus are over 12% of that as well, and so on. So after one year, I'll have 1 plus R over 12 for 12 months times my original $1. That's calculating interest once a month. If I to calculate interest once a week, it'd be, okay, each week I'll earn R divided by 52%, so I have my original balance plus R over 52% of it, and I do this 52 times in a year. If I do it every day, replace it to 365, 365, every hour, every second, every millisecond. This led Euler to the wondering about the quantity 1 over r to the n to the nth power as n becomes bigger and bigger and bigger every day, every hour, every second, every nanosecond. All right, so he wondered if this limit exists. This is the natural limit that comes from compound interest. Obviously, I went very through this very fast then. Um, I'm assuming we're familiar with this basically already, but the question is, is the number that arises from this limit the same as the e from calculus? Well, just to make my life easier again, let's assume our interest rate is 100%, that is r is 1. So let's now actually focus on the limit as n goes to infinity. Let me clean up my board here, and let's write this in bright red. The limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 over n to the n. As you play with this on a calculator, it seems to converge to a particular number, about 2.7. Um, of course, seeming to converge and actually converging are different things. Sometimes many things in mathematics seem to converge, but you have to go up to about 20 billion terms before you realize they don't. Um, so the question is, does this limit exist? And is this limit, which is called E in a pre-calculus course, the same E as calculus? Here goes. I'm going to make use of the function y equals 1 over x. It comes from the natural logarithm. Let me graph this thing. Oh, where's my pen gone? It's missing. Here we go. 
Here is the graph y equals 1 over x. And I'm going to choose a section of it from the 1 up to, well, something related to this problem, to the point 1 plus 1 over n. And I'm going to look at, at the area under this graph from 1 up to 1 over n. From what I said at the beginning of the, of the, uh, of the uh, lecture today, that is the logarithm of uh, 1 plus 1 over n. Well, clearly, that area is smaller than the area of this whole big rectangle, which is one unit high. That is, if I put plug in y equals x equals 1, 1 over 1 is 1. So this is actually smaller than this rectangle. It's 1 high and 1 nth wide. So this is less than 1 times 1 nth. At the same time, we need a different color here. It's bigger than this rectangle, which is 1 nth wide. And its height is the height of the function at this point here, 1 over 1 plus 1 over n. So for voila, there's a little relation. Let me multiply through by n. Uh, so this, this left part times n will just be 1 over 1 plus 1 over n is less than n times log of 1 plus 1 over n is less than this right part times n, 1. Oh, nice property of logarithms. Uh, let me just clear some space here because I can no longer need my little picture. Do, 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 do. Is that um, an exponent out front of a logarithm is the same as having an exponent, exponent hiding inside. So I've now got 1 over 1 plus 1 over n is less than the log of 1 plus 1 over n to the nth power is less than 1. And let us see what happens as n goes to infinity. Well, this part certainly wants to become 1 over 1 plus 1 over something huge wants to go to 0, so this is 1. This right hand side, of course, wants to be 1. And I've got something in between that's stuck between two things that want to be 1. In the limit, this obviously wants to be 1 as well. So I've basically I've now proven the limit as n goes to infinity of the log of 1 plus 1 over n to the nth power is 1. Well, what quantity in a logarithm wants to have the answer 1? Log of what equals 1? Well, since I'm in the natural logarithm base, turns out this guy basically wants to be e. There it is. The e coming from calculus is the same as the e coming from compound interest. That's it. Now all I've worked very hard to get this number first here. I had to prove that this is actually an increasing sequence bounded above and therefore the limit exists which he dubbed a special constant. He didn't call it e. That's a little arrogant to call a constant after your own self. But in the end it became known as e in his honor. And it's very curious that it's actually the same e that sits under the graph y equals 1 over x coming from the natural logarithm function. In fact, some people define e in terms of that y equals 1 over x graph first and then derive these other two properties from it. That's um, nice mathematically. It's not very intuitive for the first encounter with calculus in this work. So there we have it. The two e's from calculus and compound interest are actually the same e, and that's good to know. Thanks very much.